Tokyo, Tokyo Live, Live Endoscopic, Endoscopic 1. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, session. So uh, this session is a, a special session discussing the po poem in the children. So uh, I'm Haru Inoue uh, from Showa University Koto Tersa Hospital uh, Digestive Disease Center. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, three great panelists. Uh, so, uh, each of them so talk uh, 10 minutes and then uh, uh, at the very end of this session, uh, we will uh, have a, a discussion all together. And the other discussant, uh, we invite uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Hironari Shiwaku. So uh, he is uh, Associate Professor of uh, Surgery of uh, Fukuoka University. So uh, he has a uh, so maybe uh, Shivak sensei you have the thousand experience, not yet. Uh, over four hundred cases of point porcelain. Over, sorry, over four hundred. Great, great number. Thank you for kind introduction. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I would like to introduce the first speaker. So uh, first speaker is a uh, uh, the Dr. Valerio Barazzone. Uh, he is. Uh, uh, from the digestive surgery and the therapeutic endoscopy, a uh, bambino I uh, guess uh, uh, children's hospital, so Rome, Italy. So um, Valerio, so uh, please start your lecture. Okay, hello everybody. Shall I share my screen? Thanks for your kind invitation. I am Valerio Barassone, I work in Rome in Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital and I will present our experience with POEM in children. I have nothing to declare. Pediatric achalasia is rare and the disease is often a part of a syndromic presentation like AAA syndrome. The main diagnostic latency between the presentation and the diagnosis is one year. As we know well, the workup in adult is based on manometry and the sophagram findings, and endoscopy is mainly employed to rule out pseudoachalasia. The severity of symptoms is generally evaluated by using Eckhart's score. As children are less compliant to a sophagram or high-resolution manometry, and no validated metrics for Chicago classification are available, a high level of experience is necessary to establish the correct diagnosis and therefore the consequent management. Endoscopy is not mandatory, but it could be helpful to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis or congenital strictures together with mini probe evaluation. Validated symptoms evaluation scales for children are necessary. As for adults, we can distinguish in temporary treatments like Botox or PBD, which we reserve to children with several comorbidities or temporarily unfit for definitive treatments, like POEM or laparoscopic heller myotomy. In our hospital, we can offer both treatment and choose it together with the families, mainly according to achalasia subtype. Nevertheless, from 2016, no laparoscopic heller myotomy has been performed. The procedure is not modified. It starts with a mucosal incision, which can be anterior or posterior according to clinical needs and operator experience. Then a submucosal tunnel is created until we reach gastric landmarks to protect the mucosal flap. Third, a customized circular myotomy is performed according to the manometry findings. Last, the mucosal entry is closed with several standard clips. Same tools and equipment for adults can be employed in children over 10 kg of weight. In our center, we now use Harbin Knife T. As the learning curve requires high volume center, a formal training will allow you to have better clinical results and to learn more effective management of possible adverse events 
anti-correct surveillance protocols. Most of children were type 1 or type 2 achalasia, but we also have a misdiagnosed type 3 who already received a hyalurmyotomy. Main symptoms were dysphagia and vomit, but retrosternal pain was also referred in 10 children. Mean ECHO score was 7 of 12. Our protocol was lightly adapted from the Japanese one and consists in two esophagram before and three months after poem, high resolution manometry at the World Cup and six months after poem, endoscopy and pH impedance 12 months after poem and every two years also after the transition to adults hospital. This schedule was not completed only in patients referred from abroad, also because of pandemics. About safety, three patients needed intraprocedural abdominal puncture to evacuate CO2, three patients had a pleuritis, two patients had a prolonged fasting for mucosal burn, and one patient required clips plus endoloop endoscopic suture for mucosotomidations. One patient required a prolonged intubation and chest puncture because of room ray infection, so now we check twice before starting the procedure. Any adverse event was managed in a conservative fashion. This is the worst adverse event we had. A day sense of the mucosotomy because of an ineffective closure that was performed by a trainee. The incision was too close to the spine and the clips were not correctly placed. Initially, we kept the patient fasting for one week, but the esophagram you saw demonstrated an extravasation of the contrast into the previous submucosal tunnel. So we scoped the guy and we removed all the remaining clips and irrigated the tunnel with antibiotics. We used an end loop to approximate the two clips previously placed on each side of the mucosotomy. Repeating the suturing technique for several times, we could manage the distance between the two sides of the mucosal incision. He was discharged after another week and now he is totally fine. These are our main findings. Our median follow-up is 30 months at the moment. All patients had an ECHO score under 3 after POEM. 24 patients had an improved esophagram. One girl required a pneumatic balloon dilatation because of the scar of a mucosal burn at the level of the EG junction and she is one of the two patients who temporarily needed PPI for GERD. As you can see, only one girl in our population had a pathologic acid exposure time of the pH monitoring, but it's always difficult to distinguish between GERD and stagnation, as a low baseline impedance is generally found in these motility disorders, the evaluation of reflux episodes could be underestimated. As we could expect, the IRP4 often stays high but we noted a reduction of the less basal pressure in the majority of patients. Both impedance and manometry confirm a reduction of water retention. This is one of the oldest and more cooperative guy we treated. He had a type 2 achalasia. Low flow CO2 inflation is mandatory in children. The distal attachment is a standard and is fixed to the endoscope with tape and generally easy to use about 10 kg of weight. We prefer a posterior approach and use the same device for injection, cut and coagulation. If you use this tool correctly, no coagulation forceps is generally necessary. A selective circular myotomy is performed according to the achalasia type and the manometry finding. The mucosa is now closed with several creeps.
This girl was a sigmoid type 1 achalasia and you can notice the improvement of the esophageal clearance and the shape of the esophagram after the procedure. We have only one case of congenital stricture treated with POEM. She was a 7 year old girl with a vomit and dysphagia starting from weaning. We evaluated the congenital stricture with mini probe and demonstrated the absence of tracheobronchial remnants, which is predictive for low response to mechanical or pneumatic balloon dilatation. In fact, she failed to improve despite nine dilatations. This is the last attempt, and you can notice the length of the stricture. So, we decided to attempt a submucosal approach. It was a difficult tunneling, and we noted a mucosal thermal injury opposite to the tunnel in the middle of the stricture, so we aborted the myotomy and closed the tunnel and placed a nasogastric tube. We managed her as an esophageal perforation, and the girl was discharged eight days after the technical failure with a liquid diet and a program of elective surgical resection. Surprisingly, in the next few weeks she could tolerate a progressive refeeding including solid food and she referred no dysphagia. The esophageal resection was cancelled and the girl is still fine. We hypothesized that the incomplete procedure was still useful to promote the food passage and a progressive dilatation of the narrow tract. We have also experience with children referred for dysphagia or chest pain after laparoscopic color myotomy with or without anti-reflux surgery. As pediatric surgeons generally prefer to wait till the end of puberal spurt before performing a flap valve in order to prevent its migration through the diaphragm, we encountered a greater than expected acceptance for POEM with the program of a secondary elective anti-reflux procedure if necessary. Of course, the absence of a flap valve makes easier to understand what is the reason for the recurrence. Timing of presentation is also important to understand the reason for recurrence. An early recurrence in the first six months after myotomy is generally caused by an incomplete extension or wrong tunnel orientation in case of POEM procedure. This girl was referred from Portugal for severe dysphagia after Heller despite three stepwise pneumatic balloon dilatation and the surgical removal of the flap valve. We did POEM in 2018. As we worked on the posterior side of the esophagus, we encountered only a mild fibrosis because of the PBDs, but the procedure was completed without problem. We could complete the second myotomy and confirm the gastric side extension as demonstrated by this big trifurcate vessel and the patient has no dysphagia anymore. When a late recurrence is related to a tight flap valve, the long-term prognosis is not a happy, but we can still hope it was a misdiagnosed spastic disorder, like in this 13-year-old guy with triple A syndrome, which had severe chest pain and dysphagia despite pneumatic balloon dilatation and Herler door performed in Germany in July 2020. The esophagram and manometry at our center confirm esophageal spasms. After POEM, all these symptoms were resolved and a weight improvement of 5 kg in 6 months was noted. He needed PPI for 2 months after the procedure but no symptoms of GERD after that trial. Also, its pH impedance 6 months after POEM is negative despite an anterior standard surgical myotomy and a posterior endoscopic long myotomy. In conclusion, POEM is a reliable, safe and effective option also for pediatric population. It has a role also in the management of recurrence and its spastic disorder, but its indication for congenital stricture has to be discussed, as no validated scores for symptoms and metrics for Chicago classification are available. The manoimpedance symmetry improvement after POEM could be evaluated. A formal training in high volume center is strongly recommended to ensure clinical results and to learn the management of possible adverse events.
Thanks for your kind attention. Sir, thank you very much, uh, Valerio. The, <coughs> first, the con congratulation is a great result. So you have the extensive uh, experience of the poem in the children. So you showed us a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> unusual cases. So uh, thank you very much. So we have a discussion at the end of this session. So uh, we'd like to uh, proceed to the uh, second speaker. So second speaker is uh, Nikos. So uh, Dr. Nikos is uh, now the president of a Greek uh, patient society of uh, Carasia. So uh, from Thessaloniki, so second largest city in Greece. So uh, he will uh, uh, give us a lecture. So Nikos, please. Uh, dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, hello to everybody. And thank you very much for kind invitation and honor to be here to present this uh, case report. Actually, my topic is poem plus temporary removable fully covered uh, stand for congenital sopagia stenosis. And when I searched in the PAMED uh, poem for uh, congenital sopagia stenosis, I found only one study to 2021 from digestive dissenters, retrospective, retrospective study. Uh, with six patients. In two patients, poem was not possible due to technical issues. In another four, poem completed and solved the situation by experienced endoscopist. Only two months follow up, and the real su clinical success is not, to my poor opinion, not 100%, 67%, but this is great for congenital stenosis. Uh, the experts, of course, propose that delation is the standard treatment and they fail twice the surgery. And my poem case was performed in May. Uh, 2019 in a 39 years old female who referred to me uh, with a manometric misdiagnosis of a halasia of DG junction and obstruction. She get multiple episodes of undipaction last year before poem. And uh, uh, manometry, this is the manometry, ILP was 32 millimeter mercury. And this is the great problem that manometry, even high resolution manometry, cannot uh, differentiate ahalasia, motility disorder, which is mask disease, from congenital esophageal stenosis, which is fibrotic disease. So uh, this is the image of previous hospital. So I organized poem as usual, posterior poem, which is quick and easy and safe. And uh, uh, I saw some uh, findings in gastroscopy during the fourth poem that the G-junction was not so tight, uh, was identified in 39, 40 centimeters, just normal. The stenotic area was uh, quite la uh, long, uh, four to five centimeters, it was not like a ring. So it goes for 34 to 38 centimeters, for five centimeters. And there's no contractions, uh, which usually is seen in Agalasia. And the upper surface was not elated. So I organized poem far from the stenotic area in Kozaloping 28 centimeters, six centimeters above. Uh, the first part of the tunnel was easy. And when I reached the stenotic area, I faced the total fibrosis. I faced the severe fibrosis uh, like that. Uh, here is the first part of the tunnel. Here is the fibrotic tissue. Uh, fortunately, it was no difficult to create the uh, tunnel to, through this fibrotic area. So I completed the tunnel and uh, up uh, extended to the gastric side, three centimeters. And then my otomy. So uh, after finished poem without any complication uh, and control through esophageal lumen, stenosis still remains, no change at all. And uh, I like that. This is the myotomy, but there's still some fibrotic tissue there. I support that this fibrotic tissue remains the mucosal side. So I decided thereafter to, uh, to perform the fibrotomy from uh, tunnel to the plastic side. This is a risky decision, of course. Uh, but um, I had enough experience of poem, 130 poems at that time. And this is, this uh, was open like that, uh, but uh, I tried to catch and cut uh, the uh, fibrotic tissue uh, slowly, slowly, uh, and then uh, one centimeter, uh, 38 centimeters, two centimeters above the digest, I had this small mucosal tear. If I had this small, small mucosal tear in a po in a halasia case, this could not be a problem. But uh, stenosis still remains because I tried to place some clip. There's no place for maneuver maneuverability. 
Finally, I placed two clips and finished poem, uh, but I was not so really, really the fibrotic tissue reaches up to the epithelium and the muscular mucosa. Uh, you can see here how transparent is the epithelium. And if you place the clip, you can, uh, by the clip, you can increase the mucosal tear because it's only epithelium. And then uh, I finished poem like that. Six hours later, is of our gram or so, the rapid passes like that, and no, uh, and no, uh, 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 no uh, further, uh, uh, no leakage. Here is the chest x ray. Next day, of course, patient has symptoms, and that it was not so good. She can chest pain. So I decided to perform. Uh, 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 thorax, thoracic CD, which shows this uh, uh, bilateral transfusion and no real communication. This is my first time I had such a thing. In this case, phenomenically an easy poem case. So I decided to like that here. You see the contrast uh, in the esophagus. Then I perform gastroscopy, and the gastroscopy showed this white tissue, and actually. Uh, I had some uh, a small opening here. So I decided uh, stenosis remained. And I decided maybe I place a larger clip. This was not so good idea because when I tried to remove the small clips and place larger ones, patient collapsed uh, by, with the help of the anesthesiologist, of course. And then I stopped uh, uh, gastroscopy uh, without clips. Uh, the, 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 I resuscitated the patient. Patient had no comorbidities. Uh, she induced in the intensive care unit. Uh, this is the photo. No intubation was necessary, but the thoracic surgeon placed a tube here to uh, uh, drain the, uh, by the, the uh, pleural infusion. And then one day later, after stabilization of the patient, I performed again gastroscopy and I found the mucosal perforation. But fortunately, it was two centimeters above the G-junction. G-junction, he was intact, and the stenosis still remains. So the only way to go thereafter is to place a fully covered removal surgical scrub the stand to close the gap like that. I performed that. To place a stand in a halaza case, a risky decision with the risk of migration in case of dilatation. But fortunately, this was not an halaza, was congenital esophageal stenosis. Patient uh, stand remained in place uh, for uh, one month, uh, three weeks later, patient was uh, in place. Patient discharged after three days because it was good. And uh, uh, one uh, month later, uh, three, uh, 30 June was like that. And then 1st July, we removed the stand. Removing the stand uh, was uh, the, the perforation was closed. And what was obviously is that the stenosis was very well calibrating and no more stenosis. And to, during the three years follow-up, patients is totally normal. She became uh, pregnant and gave delivered a healthy boy. And uh, uh, it was uh, absolutely normal without stenosis. So ladies and gentlemen, according to this uh, one case, uh, only one case, I thought that um, high resolution manometry cannot differentiate the highlights of congenitus of vaginal stenosis. Congenital esophageal stenosis may begin in childhood and may reach in adulthood. Thereafter, patient, uh, the mother of the patient told us that uh, dysphagia begins at the age of nine years old. At that time, pediatric surgeons in England advised them for surgery. She refused and she lived for 30 days with semi solid diet because the uh, stenosis was not uh, uh, absolute stenosis, but it was moderate stenosis. And so poem can be feasible for congenital esophageal stenosis. Poem alone might not be efficient and the stand alone is not indicated, but the combination of poem plus temporary stand, removable stand, irrespective of perforation or not, immediately after poem for better calibration of the stenosis, might be a safe, efficient, efficient, individualized, minimally invasive endoscopic treatment for congenital esophageal stenosis, alternatively to orsophagectomy. But of course, individualized approach is necessary. Further international experience is necessary. Many uh, issues would be taking place. 
and um, of course experience from endoscopic side of view. And uh, this is the patient is uh, uh, last year 22, 2021, uh, the assembly of patients uh, uh, in Cyprus. This is the uh, Greek, uh, the Greek association which uh, we were induced in Cyprus. She is the patient and she is her mother. And uh, I will finish my talk and thank you very much for your kind invitation with this uh, ancient Greek uh, philosopher. If you're against the cynic, it's the same as last year, but now he says, he said this in a sunny day in Athens with this lamp for an honest man. So a Halasian patients must search for an honest group who can uh, approach their uh, uh, real problem. And thank you very much for your kind attention invitation. So thank you so much, uh, Nikos, uh, great talk. And the uh, <clears throat> a nice demonstration of a tough case of uh, uh, congenital esophageal stenosis. So of course the congenital disease or started, as you mentioned, started at the childhood, of course, uh, but the <clears throat> Uh, actually, uh, we have a several patients uh, so who reach the uh, uh, age of 30s or age of 40s. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. A great case demonstration. And the last speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Alina Fujiyoshi. So uh, she is uh, now the uh, uh, clinical, clinical fellow over St. Michael Hospital in Toronto. So. Uh, uh, she has, uh, uh, yes, uh, lots of experience in the Toronto, I think. Okay, so uh, Lina, please start your lecture. Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction, Professor Inoue. Um, I'll share my screen. So I'm going to talk about um, the diagnosis of congenital esophageal stenosis in adults and its treatment with peroral endoscopic myotomy based on our experience. I have no COI. And as we know, congenital esophageal stenosis in adults is a rare disorder that can present as achalasia, particularly in the distal esophagus. And there are three types of CES. First one is the tracheobronchial remnants, which is the most common type and seen more often in the lower esophagus. The second type is fibromuscular thickening. And the third type is membranous web, which is the least common and occurring in the upper and mid esophagus. And although histologic evaluation is used to establish the diagnosis of CES, the following can help us um, distinguish CES from achalasia, the medical history, endoscopic examination, high resolution manometry, and barium esophagogram. The ideal therapeutic strategy for CES remains controversial and management often involves pneumatic balloon dilation or surgical resection, depending on the CES type. So the um, for FMT or the fibromuscular thickening, uh, thickening and um, membranous web, uh, the preferred options are PBD or myotomy, whereas um, surgical interventions are often reserved for unsuccessful cases and for tracheobronchial remnants. We reported six patients referred to um, Showa University, Koto Toyosu Hospital, with presumed diagnosis of achalasia established elsewhere and ultimately diagnosed with congenital esophageal stenosis. So for the clinical findings, all patients in our study have been experiencing dysphagia for as long as they can remember and without any history of prior treatment. These patients have modified their eating habits, for example, eating smaller quantities more frequently, chewing more, softening their food, or drinking more water. However, they eventually sought medical consult as adults due to superimposed episodes of food impaction. Two out of six patients experienced chest pain relieved by intake of water. Five out of them um, reported regurgitation and the average Eckhart symptom score before POEM for all patients was 
For the endos um, endoscopic findings, ring-shaped stenosis located on the lower third portion of the esophagus was seen in five out of six patients. However, one patient showed a rosette-like configuration of the EGJ. So here we can see the actual cases. Um, for cases one, two, three, five, and six, we can see the uh, ring-shaped stenosis with a normal smooth overlying mucosa except for case four, where a rosette-like confirmation is evident, similar to achalasia. For high-resolution manometry findings, um, it showed hindered or obstructed water passage as indicated by a compartmentalized intervals pressure pattern. The obstruction, however, was made by the stenosis, not the lower esophageal sphincter, Therefore, a distinction between the stenotic area and the LAS was possible in four of six cases, as seen here in um, cases one, two, four, and case five. In two cases, like case three and case six, the distinction between the stenotic area and the LAS was impossible since the stenotic part was coinciding with the LAS. The median LES pressure was 44.35, median IRP was 21.2, and median intervals pressure was 22.9. For barium esophagram, we observed the presence of peristalsis in a visible esophageal, dis, uh, esophageal lumen distal to the stricture, and we coined this as lopsided hourglass sign. Here we can see in uh, cases one, two, four, five, and six, the visible esophageal lumen distal to the stricture. And again, we coined this as lopsided hourglass sign. And in addition, when an invisible horizontal line is drawn on top of the dome of the left diaphragm, the location of the stenosis in four patients, again, cases one, two, five, and six, were above this line. Um, proximal to the LES. So this is the summary of the salient um, features of um, CES in our cases. As you can see again, um, for endoscopic findings, five out of six presented with the ring shaped stenosis, um, with the barium esophagram, um, also five out of six cases show the lopsided hourglass sign. So I'm going to um, show a short video of the poem technique done in one of the cases. So of course, poem was carried out under general anesthesia using a single channel endoscope. And of course, with a transparent distal attachment. Here we can see the ring, uh, ring shape stenosis. Then we uh, did the mucosal entry. However, of course, in um, compared to achalasia, the submucosal tunnel created um, the submucosal was created uh, similar to the poem technique, but in uh, in CES, the submucosal tunnel cannot pass through the submucosa and the stenotic part. And here we encounter an unusual muscle layer structure. As we try to dissect this area. So we see here the circular muscle fiber. We can identify it clearly. In CES, the muscularis mucosa is encountered since the submucosal layer is narrow and it makes it difficult to get into the submucosal space. So we advance with myotomy of the circular muscle fibers and we make the separation of the mucosal layer from the circular muscle-like tissue of the stenosis by pulling away and cutting the circular muscle-like fiber.
So here we cut the longitudinal muscle fiber to open up the parasophageal space. And we see here the parasophageal space. And beyond the stenosis part, we dig into the separated um, submucosal layer. After that, we resurface or re-enter the, sub, uh, the submucosal layer. And we return to partial myotomy. So now we can see here after the myotomy, So this was one of the successful cases of poem and CES. So we can see here the results. Um, poem was attempted in all six um, cases. However, for the first two cases, we could not complete um, the procedure due to technical difficulty, um, difficulty in exposing um, and dissecting the submucosa and advancing through the stenotic area. However, for the four subsequent um, patients, we were able to complete the uh, procedure successfully. And among the four successful POEM cases, all had an improvement in Eckhart's score to less than three at the two-month follow-up. And we can see also that there was a um, marked improvement in the um, HRM findings, as well as the barium results here. Um, one example is case six, showing um, the two-month post-POEM findings. Um, barium esophagram shows a marked improvement in the passage of contrast through the previously stenotic area during the two-month follow-up compared to pre-poem. So in summary, the salient features of uh, congenital esophageal stenosis in adults include the following, a long-standing history of dysphagia, ring-shaped stenosis on endoscopic examination, lopsided hourglass sign on barium esophagram, HRM findings indicated by a compartmentalized intravole pressure pattern with distinction between the stenotic area and the lower esophageal sphincter. Overall, co-evaluation of the medical history with endoscopic, barium esophagram, and HRM findings is of paramount importance in establishing an accurate diagnosis of CES in adults. POEM appears as an alternative treatment other than surgical intervention for CES patients who fail dilation. Um, thank you very much again for your kind um, attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Liner. Um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, nice uh, uh, review of the uh, uh, so uh, uh, congenital esophageal uh, stenosis is not a popular disease, so not so many. So um, yes, a review of uh, paper, and also um, you showed us a very nice the. Uh, um, uh, successful procedure so uh, everybody is going to have uh, difficult it is uh, compared to the regular uh acaracia patient so uh we would like to uh, start the discussion so um so i would like uh, ask uh, uh dr shivaku do you have uh, uh any um uh, any question to the uh, um uh, panelists yes thank you so first, I would like uh, I would like to ask to Valerio about uh, mainly on uh, poem procedure for uh, children, 
And first question is indication of poem for children. So uh, from what age do you have performed a poem procedure or do you have any other standards except age, so if you have? Hmm. Thank you for your question. Uh, so basically we have the technical limit of uh, 10 kilograms which allows us to perform the procedure safely and use uh, standard uh, tools. Mm -hmm. And But uh, above, above this, uh, if the diagnosis is uh, well established, we have no age limit. We have uh, one, one case of uh, probably a case, but it was a 11 month girl. And if you want, I can show you the high resolution manometry. Uh, but uh, since uh, we have no uh, metrics for the diagnosis, so we saw the uh, uh, water retention and the impaired volus clearance, but we were not sure 100% about the diagnosis, we decided to have a, a wait, wait and see approach. So we put a gastrostomy bag and uh, one dilatation, and we are waiting her for uh, weight improvement and uh, grow up uh, until we can be sure about the diagnosis. But uh, if the diagnosis is sure, we can uh, approach uh, about these kilograms. Mm. Thank you. So uh, it is very difficult problem because uh, there is no fixed fix, uh, standard for a point for children. And mm. uh, in our institution, so I usually wait until two, 20 kilograms because mm. Uh, for uh, children with 10 kilograms, it is very difficult to perform a re regular point procedure. So uh, endoscopic equipment is uh, too big for them. So it is very difficult. Yes, and also, the, and also the diagnosis is uh, still difficult. You, you need uh, uh, an expert uh, pediatrician to perform a, a pretty uh, short and effective manometry and uh, he need to interpret uh, some data. It's not, uh, it's not easy for sure, but uh, our, my, our pediatrician is pretty expert. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a very mm. nice discussion. Uh, I, mm. I totally agree with you. So, um, so minimal, minimum uh, body weight is a uh, must be a 10, 10 kilograms. So otherwise, so as you are uh, both of you mentioned that it's impossible to pass through the endoscope. So we, uh, we need a distal attachment and also uh, we can apply the uh, small caliber endoscope if necessary, but uh, definitely we need a 2.8 millimeter channel to complete this procedure. We, we, need, uh, we need an injection, mm -hmm. injection catheter, we need uh, some kind of a knife to complete this procedure. So, 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 so thinking about that, so as uh, uh, Barerio mentioned the uh, uh, minimum body weight uh, should be more than 10 kilogram. And if possible, uh, we can wait. So 12, 15, and 17 kilograms, so much, much better. So uh, we can go to the safe side. Yeah, so very, very important point. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Yes. Yeah, so. Thank you, Professor Inoue. And I want to ask a second question to Barerio. So uh, I'd like to ask about uh, direction of myotomy in a point procedure mm -hmm. for children. So uh, which direction do you prefer or do you recommend uh, anterior or posterior? So I learned the poem in the posterior era. So when I was in Koto Toyosu, I learned the posterior. So for me, it's uh, easier. But uh, I think uh, we can uh, consider uh, the opposite approach in a second poem case. Um, and we, we, tr we try to keep the technical teaching of uh, Professor Rinoe, so we respect uh, our uh, posterior orientation, uh, sling muscle, and uh, all these uh, milestones. The only thing we don't, uh, we don't do is the second scope uh, to check the the length of the myotomy because uh, the space is too narrow. Yeah, so actually, so uh, Valerio, so you have a lot of experience of a children's uh, poem. So uh, when you approach, so uh, uh, usually you approach the posterior wall at the time. So any, uh, so it's a totally same to our adult. Is it right? Yeah, 100%. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I noticed uh, your uh, endoscopic image. So posterior myotomy with preserving sling fibers. So you're a skilled doctor, so you can do a poem with sling fiber preservation and it may lead to uh, reduce a uh, guard of the poem procedure. <laughs> but uh, the reason why I ask uh, to you about the direction of the myotomy is from my experience. Um, in my experience, unfortunately, I perform uh, posterior myotomy without preserving sling fibers because we did not the importance of preserving sling fibers at the time. And after that, uh, the patient or uh, the patient was uh, very, very young and uh, he need a long time prescription of PPI. So uh, posterior anatomy with sling fibers is uh, easy for expert, but for beginners, Sometimes it is difficult, but when we perform an anterior myotomy, uh, preserving sling fibers is maybe easier than uh, posterior myotomy. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, anterior myotomy or uh, posterior myotomy with uh, preserving sling fibers are acceptable, but it depends on their experience. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. If I can say something, uh, we have a, we we showed one case of uh, two myotomy. So the German patient was a uh, uh, anterior standard surgical myotomy and posterior long myotomy. And even in that case, uh, we respected slim muscle, and we in, we have no no patient under PPI at the moment. So mm -hmm. of course we have not enough number to uh, compare with the uh, the GERD report and lit literature. But uh, yeah, we have no control cases. So we all, all 25 patients, we respected the slim muscle. And at the moment, no patient are under PPI, no patient have a positive pH impedance. But that's only this preliminary experience, of course. Thank you, Barrio. And next, uh, I want to ask to uh, Nikos about uh, mainly on uh, congenital esophageal stenosis. And how many cases, how many cases did you experience congenital esophageal stenosis in Greece? Uh, hello, Svaku Sensei. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes actually, hear I don't have any other experience of congenital esophageal stenosis because uh, usually we have congenital esophageal ring and we perform uh, dilat savary dilatation. This case was from Cyprus and uh, it came for us with misdiagnosis of achalasia. And uh, then we faced this fibrotic uh, tissue, total fibrosis. And then uh, when I speak with the history, I realized that after that was a congenital esophageal stenosis case and not a achalasia case. I don't uh, have any other experience. Then I, 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 I searched in the internet and found this uh, article from the Digestive Disease Center, which Raina showed to me. I have some experience for fibrotic disease in a Halasia case. I have uh, three cases from 171 poems. In three cases, one was a sigmoid type esophagus with multiple Botox injection. Botox injection resulted in severe uh, destruction of mucosal space. This case was so difficult, more difficult than the uh, congenital esophageal stenosis case. Another case was uh, with uh, multi balloon dilatation cases. Uh, both were so difficult. Uh, sigmoid megaesophagus with chronic stasis who resulted in uh, fibrosis and it was uh, very thick uh, epithelium in mucosa. And it was so difficult to go to the some mucosa space and to create a tunnel. But I don't have any other experience with such cases in adults uh, with the congenital esophageal stenosis. Sorry, uh, I have you this one case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, so like that. So uh, congenital esophageal stenosis uh, incidence is not so high. So in our hospital, so far we performed the 2,600 uh, poem procedure. So among them, the uh, congenital esophageal stenosis is uh, just uh, nine patients. So it's a uh, uh, the less than 0.5% of acaracia, 0.5% of acaracia patients. 
So if you if you have the case of a 200 uh, achalasia you care, then so you encounter one patient. So that's a ratio of the uh, congenital esophagus. And so very unusual, but clinically very, very important. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Inoue. And I'd like to ask to uh, Raina Sensei uh, about uh, congenital esophageal stenosis from my experience. And uh, uh, please let us know again how to distinguish congenital esophageal stenosis from typical achalasia, because uh, it is a very important point in the session. Yes, thank you very much, um, Chiwaka Sensei. So again, um, it's like a co-evaluation of the medical history, the endoscopic findings, barium esophagram and HRM. Um, for uh, the clinical findings, there's a summary. Most CES patients, they say that their symptoms have started for as long as they can remember. Um, for endoscopic examination, we saw the ring-shaped stenosis, although um, I also showed them one case which um, presented like, as an accolade with the rosette-like um, structure, but I think majority it would present with the ring-shaped stenosis. For barium esophagram, um, it's the lopsided hourglass sign and the eso uh, visible esophageal lumen, just um, distal to the stricture. And for HRM um, findings, it's still controversial because uh, it can be difficult to distinguish the stenotic point from the uh, yeah. LES, especially if they coincide. But um, if they're not coinciding, then I think it, it's possible to distinguish that. But again, it's still very difficult. Thank you, thank you. There are uh, several points we notice, we notice congenital esophageal stenosis, but sometimes it is very difficult to distinguish. But questionnaire is very important point. Yes. At the first stage. Yes, thank you. And I want to know about the difference uh, in a uh, point procedure compared to a uh, uh, regular achalasia. So are there any different point during point procedure for congenital esophageal stenosis compared to typical achalasia? Please uh, let us know. And uh, Nikos, please let us know too. I will ask two, two presenters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and, um, just based on our experience, um, unlike in achalasia, the submucosal tunnel um, for NCES um, cannot pass through the submucosa um, in the stenotic area. So um, a working space to replace the submucosal tunnel should be created by um, incising the circular and longitudinal mu muscle layer proximal to the fibrostenotic um, segment. And after that, then, I think we can resurface or re-enter again into the submucosal um, layer. Uh, thank you very much for this important question. Because in the congenital esophageal fibrosis, there is no submucosal space. And you, you uh, I begin far from the stenotic area. When you reach this area, you see uh, the fibrotic uh, tissue goes longitudinal in front of the circular mass layer. So uh, if you inject it, you cannot uh, have uh, space. So you have to be careful to, uh, uh, to keep uh, mucosa safe. So I uh, perform the tunnel too difficult through this fibrotic tissue, intrafibrotic tissue, not uh, intramuscular, but intrafibrotic. Uh, that uh, if the uh, stenotic area is long, like in my case is three centimeters, it was so difficult. In any case, any time I started to cut, I said I could stop because uh, I thought in the beginning that it was uh, fibrotic due to long start uh, uh, halasia. Then when we passed the fibrotic area, I could pass, I could find again the uh, some mucosal uh, layer when I uh, pass through. I say, okay, I'm okay. But it has to be so careful. Otherwise, it is very easy, too easy to have a mucosal perforation. You have to recognize the fibrotic tissue. In my case, the fibrosis reaches to the muscularis mucosa and to epithelium. So I have to be careful to be in, middle, in the middle, like that. If it is not too stiff, you can pass through. It has to be slowly, slowly. Anytime you inject, 
you cannot create uh, the distance between mucosal and some new, and the muscular layer. Uh, but uh, 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 in my case, I, I, I succeeded in uh, past the fibrotic tissue and create intrafibrotic tumor. Mm -hmm. That is why. But myotomy in this case it will not uh, solve the uh, stenosis. A fibrotomy will uh, so, uh, solve the stenotic. Otherwise, you perform the poem and the patient will continue to have dysphagia. That is what my great fear in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the stent actually is this, uh, the calibrating issue. Okay, perforation, you place the stent, uh, close the perforation, okay. But uh, the stenosis, the problem which uh, was for 30 years was solved only with this. Uh, uh, I used a uh, stent with a uh, large diameter, 2.8 centimeters. And the uh, stent in place, uh, because the stenosis remained without migration, stenosis keep the stent in place. And I put the stand behind the mucosal opening because I had the clips already there. And the mucosal opening was uh, far, 28 centimeters, so that I had place with normal mucosa above and behind and stenosis. But in the, I was lucky actually in this case uh, because stenosis was in the middle of the esophagus, lower middle esophagus. So I was thinking uh, very important mucosa. question. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And then uh, I would like to ask about radio. So do you have any experience of a uh, uh, treatment of a congenital esophageal stenosis? So uh, without that uh, applying the uh, POEM procedure. So uh, do you have a, a successful excel experience of a varun dilation or some other treatment for this uh, congenital esophageal stenosis? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about a fibromuscular type. Yeah, yeah, so we we generally approach uh, early presentation of uh, uh, stenosis. So generally, the, this child uh, presents symptoms when they start eat solid food. When they pass from milk to solid food, you already have uh, dysphagia. And uh, um, we we developed this approach uh, based on uh, mini probe US evaluation, which is one of the last indication of uh, mini probe US probably in our center. And so we evaluate the wall of the esophagus with the mini probe, and uh, we establish the prognosis uh, according to the to the findings. So if we find the tracheobronchial remnants. We know that uh, the response to the dilatation, which is generally savary, mechanical, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's better. So we try to approach uh, these uh, at least three uh, dilatation. Uh -huh. But uh, when, when we yeah, find- uh, So uh, when you apply the savary, savary uh, Gillard or uh, dilation, so uh, don't you have an experience of a laceration of a full layer laceration and the like? And absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah. They're pretty, pretty common, but uh, conservative treatment and generally they improve. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, when we find the fibrotic uh, fibromuscular uh, structure, uh, we generally find that the response to the dilatation is pretty bad. And uh, we have a lot of uh, recurrence. And when you dilate the patient, you have the feeling like, like the savaries, the esophagus is keeping the savaries. Uh, it's a really, really strange feeling in a child. And mm -hmm. um, generally, we uh, in this kind of patient, we tend to avoid uh, too many dilatation because we know that uh, after that, uh, the surgical resection is a mess. So you, you have a long, uh, you, you need to, to put some uh, like colon or jejunum into the yeah, so far. So, so we, we prefer to be not, not too much aggressive in this kind of uh, uh, field. We have only one patient that we, we showed before with the uh, uh, congenital stricture approach with POEM. And honestly, I, I don't know because why she improved because we basically felt like a technical failure, but uh, she improved. So this is the only in, uh, experience we have. And uh, at the moment, we, uh, we, we don't perform POEM for congenital stricture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually, uh, when we apply the baron dilation for the uh, congenital esophageal stenosis, at the time, so we feel that the uh, uh, more heart tissue than uh, uh, regular achalasia patient. So regular achalasia uh, patient is uh, like a lava band. 
So it's a, when we uh, dilate the lumen, so it's a stretch, temporary, temporary, but they're coming back. But anyway, so, but uh, compared to that, so uh, congenital esophageal stenosis is a more rigid, more tight. So I, I, I think so any, uh, any treatment is a very, very difficult to control the disease. Mm. So, um, so, <laughs> so discussion and continues, but uh, the, the, uh, we we have to conclude this session. And then uh, I, I, I um, so one thing. So uh, uh, when we treat the uh, uh, congenital esophageal stenosis, uh, it's a it's a the point is uh, it uh, barium swallow mimicking. It's a very similar, looks very similar to uh, standard uh, Carasia patient. So. Uh, before treating uh, these patients with POEM. So uh, if you talk to the patient or patient family, so if we receive the POEM procedure, you can get him better soon or like that. So very um, uh, easy uh, uh, explanation is uh, may cause a disaster. So in the case of a uh, congenital esoph esophageal stenosis, so we have to tell the patient and the patient family, so, uh, the patient need maybe after treatment, uh, one week fasting. So as uh, a potential risk as uh, a patient has and then uh, improvement after a uh, poem is uh, not perfect. So better than before, but not perfect. So a Carisha patient, we can say, so after poem procedure, you can eat well. But uh, so in the case of a congenital esophageal stenosis, so we have to be very careful not to, <laughs> so uh, yeah, correct explanation uh, to the patient and patient family, we, we, we should do it. So, so uh, thank you very much, so everyone. So uh, three panelists and the, uh, one uh, the great uh, the comment, uh, Shivak Sensei as well. So uh, it's a uh, please uh, remember the uh, so uh, pediatric patient and even uh, middle age the patient may have the congenital esophageal stenosis. It's not just a uh, common disease, but we have to know. So everybody, thank you so much. We'd like to close this session. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.